Oh, listeners, thank you as always for tuning in, and a very special thanks to my patrons Jeff Prebeg, Jeannie Eichard, Torsten Pill, Chris Watson, and Kim Boschkovsky. I'm opening this episode with a special announcement that I'm really excited to share with you. I have joined forces with Reason Revolution, a website about secular humanism, atheism, skepticism, and free thought. This podcast, A Leap of Doubt, is now a production of Reason Revolution and is now featured on the website, reasonrevolution.org, and on the website's YouTube channel. You can now listen to this show directly from the website as well. I am very grateful to Reason Revolution co-founder Tyler Lovins for reaching out to me about collaborating in this way, and I am really excited to see where this little project of mine goes. I also want to give a special shout-out to my friend and author Guy P. Harrison, a journalist and science writer I really admire, who just published his eighth book. The book is titled, At Least Know This, Essential Science to Enhance Your Life, available now from Prometheus Books. This book is a primer on essential science literacy, with chapters covering the most basic and foundational questions on which science has shed light. When did everything begin? What is everything made of? What is life? How did we get here? And so on. At one point in my conversation with Zarin Feroz on this episode, we talked about the wonder and beauty of science, and we both commiserated on the fact that there is so much fascinating scientific knowledge to explore and learn about, and so little time. Guy's book and the areas of scientific knowledge it covers serves as an excellent place to begin what I hope will be a lifelong journey of discovery and education for everyone. Well-informed and evidence-based books such as this that demystify and popularize science and bring critical thinking to a wider audience are crucially important, and Guy is one of the clearest and most passionate science communicators I know. I interviewed him last year on Trolling with Logic, the other podcast I help host, and I'll play a clip from that interview in which Guy describes for us his writing project. Gosh, my greatest, my greatest fantasy, man, is if I had a time machine and could go back and safely observe, you know, the first humans in Africa, the first humans to control fire, you know, I mean, just, you know, to leave Africa and explore new lands and all. I mean, what an amazing story. That's why right now, ironically, right now I'm working on my next book. It's called At Least Know This, Essential Science to Enhance Your Life. And I'm trying to answer the basic questions, you know, who are we? Where do we come from? How did we get here? You know, what's this all about? What, what is the universe? You know, all these kind of basic questions that most people in society really can't answer in a scientific manner. And I'm presenting, you know, the best answers that science can give to these basic questions, even though they're, they may be incomplete and parts of it may turn out to be wrong, you know, a decade or two from now. Still, we've all got to be exposed to these these evidence-based answers to questions like who are we because it helps us be more self-aware and kind of figure out the way forward better. But also, it's just damn exciting stuff. You know, it breaks my heart that most people don't know the human story based on evidence. They don't know the real human story because it is a it is an absolute epic adventure. So check out that book if you are so inclined. I highly recommend it. And enjoy the rest of the episode. Actually, the leap of faith, to give it the memorable name that Soren Kierkegaard bestowed upon it, is an imposture. As he himself pointed out, it is not a leap that can be made once and for all. It is a leap that has to go on and on being performed in spite of mounting evidence to the contrary. This effort is actually too much for the human mind and leads to delusions and manias. Religion understands perfectly well that the leap is subject to sharply diminishing returns, which is why it often doesn't in fact rely on faith at all, but instead corrupts faith and insults reason. You are listening to A Leap of Doubt, the podcast that celebrates science, secular humanism, and the courage it takes to embrace an evidence-based life of doubt and questioning. Hello and welcome to A Leap of Doubt, the podcast hosted by myself, Nathan Dickey. This week I am very excited to interview Zirin Feroz. 
She is an ex-Muslim from Bangladesh, a country where many atheist and agnostic bloggers have been murdered by fundamentalist Muslims in recent years. She is currently living in the U.S. as an asylum seeker and describes herself as an atheist, feminist, NASA geek, and aspiring doctor. She has talked and written about her transition from Muslim to atheist, feminist, and other places. From a young age, she started questioning the Islamic faith of her community and school. When she first learned in school about the Battle of Badr, fought by Muhammad in 624 CE against the pagan tribes of Mecca, she started to think about how morally backwards it is to praise the exploits of a religious warrior spreading religious dogma by the sword. She has talked about how her own parents tried to take her out of school and deny her an education, about the intense pressure she and her women friends were put under to get married early. As an apostate in Bangladesh, boldly and openly taking the leap of doubt. After being exposed to information on the internet critical of Islam, she faced death threats from the same people who murdered atheist bloggers in that country, who made themselves even more visible. She joins me today to talk about her life now, the transition from one culture to another, and how that process has shaped who she is today, and the kinds of things she's interested in. Welcome to the show, Zirin. It's great to have you. Thank you so much. Hey! Hello. Like, I'm so excited. Yeah. Thank you so much. So it must be like a great feeling to be able to talk to people about this in a safe country where you can speak openly and freely about these things. And so I can kind of feel your enthusiasm for being yes, able to. Yes, definitely. Do you get this feeling wherever you go? Like you're just kind of brimming with information and progressive values. And would you say that's like a key part of what you want to be doing uh, now? Oh, of course. Like, I'm always excited to talk and to share the fact that, like, I'm secular. But I do stay in a Trump county. So I mm, do have yeah. white classmates who are Trump supporters, creationists. Yeah, but I do express myself. I love talking. I love, I mean, expressing myself, but like, I'm also shy, but I, I don't enjoy public speaking, but I still mm -hmm. do it. I asked that question because I'm hearing from a lot of other activists that I know uh -huh. who are passionate about progressive ideas, uh, secularism, liberal values, all of that, that they just kind of get burned out or exhausted from all the bullshit that's happening from Trump and yeah. from the right uh -huh. and all the craziness that's going on on a daily basis. Do you ever feel some of that same burnout, that, that same sense of exhaustion that everything yeah. is just too much? And yeah. how do you deal with that? For example... I had, I mean, classmates, my, like, I mean, instructors who are Trump supporters, mm -hmm. but you, but you have to stand up for yourself and for what's right. Yeah. So I do express myself and I do get in trouble <laughs> here as well. Yeah. But there isn't much you can do. You mm -hmm. still have to fight. Like, I'm really surprised to see that I have white classmates who are, I mean, born here and they are still creationist. They think mm -hmm. that the earth is few thousand years old. So that kind of sh shook me and mm -hmm. I was like, okay, there is no reason, I mean, why I should be silent or scared of these people who are so foolish. Yeah. So, like, I'm not scared, but I do get in trouble in class because <laughs> here as well, I mean, you are not allowed to, I mean, express that, uh, you cannot, I mean, insult the faith of your classmates. So mm -hmm. it's very, I mean, difficult for secular students to, I mean, express themselves. Yeah. 
So it's difficult. Yes, because in this country, it seems like faith and religion get a free pass. Uh huh. And I'm surprised because I like it's a secular school. It's a secular、mm-hmm. public school funded just- by my tax money. So I don't <laughs> expect this from the U.S., especially after like I have been through so much, and I had this guy from my. Class. I mean, he was. I mean, offended because why? Just because I gave a speech on how life has. I mean, evolved on Earth. So that、mm-hmm. was completely ridiculous. And my, I mean, instructor. He was so mean to me, and、oh. he said that、uh, that you have to respect the faith of your classmate. And I'm like, I have not insulted the faith of my classmate. I have just explained how life has evolved on Earth. <laughs> Are you offended by science? Are you offended by facts? I'm sorry. This is something that a lot of those of us who care about science and skepticism and reason、uh-huh. have been really concerned about in this country. That it's, yeah, it's a secular country, and yet religion <laughs> is so deeply embedded in our psyche and in the way we live our lives that it's considered. Impolite to talk about one religion and two politics. Yes, it's very difficult in class, especially. Yes, I get yeah, that. Those two things, religion and politics, are the very things we need to be talking more about and having those uncomfortable discussions. Like we need people to become uncomfortable in order to get them to start thinking. I can kind of feel your pain there,、uh-huh. and it must be really surprising and disheartening at times. To come、uh-huh. from a to come from a country like Bangladesh to a country like the U.S. and still feel not to the same extent as in Bangladesh, but yes, of course, yeah. But it's but it's still there. Yeah, it's still there, and it's a lot. Talk about what brought you to the U.S. and what were some of the trials and difficulties you faced during the process of getting out of Bangladesh. Okay, it's a long story. <laughs> uh huh. I don't know where I should start, but. I just could not stay at my house, so my friend Sara, she has helped me to set up a GoFundMe account,、mm-hmm. and、uh, and US was never my first choice because the healthcare in this country is is so horrible,、mm-hmm. and the school. Here in this country, it's just like really expensive. Yeah, so U.S. was definitely not my first choice. U.K. was my dreamland. Yeah, but I could not go there.、Uh, Sweden, it was my second choice.、Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I just could not leave the country. Because it was like so expensive, and I made some mistakes regarding how to file the, I mean, paperwork. Because、mm-hmm. like I'm so young, and I have never done that. And、uh, so, USA, I just got. I mean, the school, I mean, accepted me here.、Mm-hmm. It's a two-year school, so I mean, I could pay for that, and I have also applied for scholarships, yeah, to pay for my school. Yeah, so you go where the, I mean, education is where you have scholarships. So you just had to go where you have money.、Mm-hmm. Money played a huge role, yeah, and just the fact that the, I mean, embassies they also have to, I mean, accept you, but I. Came here at a very bad time.、Mm-hmm. Trump, he kept on saying that ban all. I mean, ex. I mean, yeah, yeah, ban all Muslims. Muslims, yeah, and he did not even care about. I mean, ex Muslims or I mean, atheist, yeah. And I was like, no, I have to apply to the U.S. And at that time, I was, I mean, applying. To come to the U.S., so it was a very bad time, and it's crazy. The whole process—I mean, to come here—it's just crazy. 
Yeah, it is crazy. And I'm really glad you made it here. I'm glad you're in our country. And um, I know how difficult and tiring it can be, even at the best of times with uh-huh. a political climate. Yeah. So it's a sign of strength and resilience on your part that you were able to get the help of others because asking for help is also a sign of strength. Uh-huh. And also the perseverance of like not giving up and going through that whole terrible exhausting process. It took me two years. It took me two years to get the whole process done. It's so difficult and expensive. It's freaking ex- like, I mean, expensive. So <laughs> Trump is wrong to say that people are just coming in here. It's not like that. It's not at all like that. And this is one of the big problems I have with Trump that gets me really angry is Uh the way he misleads his followers into a wrong picture of and a wrong understanding of what immigrants are here to do. Immigrants, they enrich our culture. Mm -hmm. They bring their talents. They bring diversity. Uh They contribute a lot to our culture that Uh we benefit from immensely. And it seems like Trump and his followers are not willing to acknowledge that at all. And it's really hurting our economy and it's hurting our culture. Uh Uh-huh. U.S., like, I mean, it has the most toughest, longest vetting, I mean, process. I mean, it's like really long. The whole process to come here, it's like, like it takes people two years. I mean, average Mm -hmm. two years to come here in this country and you have to give away everything your pictures your whole family history your fingerprints your 10 fingerprints and they also track you Mm -hmm. uscis they also i mean track you yeah so you have to tell your i mean address your school a service system is there so a whole system is there and the i mean and it's just so long it's mm-hmm. long it's scary and it's really expensive yeah so it's not at all true that people are just coming in here it's a hard process and people aren't just doing it lightly <laughs> put it like that uh-huh so you came from a muslim dominated country that's pretty much secular in name only yeah So how do you respond to so many people, including especially liberals, people who I identify with politically and ideologically in a lot of ways? Me too. Who who say really factually incorrect things like... Illiberal things. Illiberal. Illiberal things that they think are liberal ideas that they're Uh espousing, such as... When people here in the West, Western liberals say things like Islam is a religion of peace. Uh huh. What is your reaction to people who are constantly saying that? Oh my God. I have said this so many times. Okay. Uh, (laughs) here is the thing. I mean, all faith are nonsense. And uh, I mean, the, I mean, Judo Christian faith, like, and the, I mean, Islamic faith, they are not peaceful. People can be nice, kind, regardless of their faith. Yeah, but Mm -hmm. the faith, I mean, itself is not a good thing. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Christopher Hitchens is the one who said that Uh um, religion is the thing that can make good people do terrible, evil things. Yes, yes. I have seen that floating around. Yeah. People are nice. Vast, I mean, majority of Muslims, they are nice. They are good people. Yeah, but Mm -hmm. they cannot take any, like, I mean, how should I say this? I mean, they cannot, I mean, accept any negative things about, I mean, Islam. Yeah, that's for me. Yes, like it's a huge thing in all Muslim or, I mean, Islamic countries. Yeah, criticism was the word I was also trying to think of. Like, they have a Uh hard time accepting criticism. This is something that's true of all religions, Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, all of it. There's something about religion that makes its followers for criticism. Uh Uh-huh. But here is the thing. I mean, I have been in two different, I mean, places, culture. One thing 
like I have seen here, Christians here, I mean, they at least won't kill you if you dare to criticize their faith. They are actually mm-hmm. more, I mean, open-minded compared to the Muslim friends, classmates like I had back in my country. Yeah, so there is a problem there. It has to do with, I mean, education, behavior, and the way you are taught how to act. Yeah, so yes, I mean, education here, it plays a huge role as well. Some, I mean, educated Muslims, they are also there who behave very badly if they find out that you are an atheist. So what are some of the uh, biggest challenges you faced in adapting to a new culture? And what about it has made your life easier? What about it is different and has made your life harder? What do you love about it? What do you hate about it? U.S. is like my home. I n- never felt like an like I mean, outsider. Mm-hmm. I have been here, I mean, only for the last two years. It will be two years soon in this, I mean, August. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And I have been at home. Like, I mean, it feels good because I am well aware I mean, about the culture, politics. So I know a lot. I already know a lot. Like, I mean, it's not like that I can't speak in, I mean, I'm in English or I can't study or I can't do anything at all. I know my, my shit. (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. The language, the culture, the manners. I mean, yeah. So it's, I feel at home, but of course, I mean, There are some challenges that I had to face and I, and I still have to face, but it's okay. That's just life. It's hard to make friends if you are an outspoken, I mean, atheist in a Mm -hmm. Trump county, in a red county. Yeah. So it's difficult to make friends as an ex Muslim or as an asylum seeker, because people are scared as soon as they hear, Oh, you're an ex Muslim. So people are scared. I mean, I had this one girl like in my class. Yeah. She refused to sit beside me. Like wow. after she heard that I'm an asylum seeker and an atheist and an ex Muslim. Yeah. So she, she won't even sit with me. She won't even, uh, talk to me in the lab. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, bigotry in this country. A and B class, yeah. So it's difficult to make friends. And as an, I mean, adult, it's difficult to make friends when you are an, I mean, adult. Because you are not going to put up with nonsense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't put up with nonsense, I mean, at all. So it's difficult for me to find friends. So like when somebody says something that's like patently untrue yeah i have to say something i have to fix bullshit if i i mean encounter them on my Mm -hmm. way i have to say something i just cannot see people doing i mean anything wrong or anything immoral or anything that's i mean anti-science so yeah but sometimes you pick your battles because i cannot be fighting with people all the time so you pick your battles a recent survey done just a few years ago, uh-huh. I think, people in the U.S. were asked what groups they distrusted the most. and Muslims and yes. atheists? <laughs> yeah, Muslims were uh, right near the top, and then right below Muslims were atheists. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so as a, an, an ex-Muslim uh-huh. who now identifies as an atheist, you have almost a double challenge, because when people hear <laughs> that you're an ex-Muslim... I think a lot of people here in the U.S. don't understand that all they hear is Muslim. They don't hear the X part. Yes, I know and- that. I know that. I have had classmates, I mean, instructors. Yes, they do that a lot. And it's really bizarre to me because it really tells me that people who fear Muslims to that extent don't really understand the history of the religion itself, because Islam is actually worships the same God that Jews and Christians do. From what I understand, Allah is believed by Muslims to be the same God as the Christian and 
Jewish God. Uh, I won't comment on that because a lot, lot of people might disagree with that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I know a lot of Christians strongly disagree with Muslims. They do too. They are not the same God because Jesus is the prophet for Muslims. Jesus is not the God for Muslims. Allah is the God and prophet. Muhammad is his last messenger. It's so stupid. I mean, all of them are stupid. It's kind of hard to talk about anything relating to religion without kind of uh, <laughs> laughing about it or, or cringing about it a little bit. And not saying stupid. Yeah, because <laughs> it is so freaking stupid. Yeah. I agree. My interest in religion has kind of evolved from mm-hmm. kind of being angry about it all the time <laughs> uh-huh. to... Being interested in religion as like a phenomenon of human nature. Like, what does it say about our faulty brains that we cling to religion so strongly? And what does Uh it say about our psychology? That's kind of my interest in Mm -hmm. religion at this point, because I came out of a fundamentalist Christian upbringing and went through the whole process that so many other people have gone through of questioning faith and coming out the other side as an atheist. I need to hear your story sometimes i've talked about it before Uh and i'll check that out that's why i love talking to other people who went through the same changes the same changes Uh because it brings a sense of solidarity to both of us Uh uh-huh yes yay yeah so you're studying nursing and Mm -hmm. in new york i believe is that correct yes and you are aspiring to become a doctor one day. Uh, because here is the thing. I have to be a U.S. I mean, citizen to get into med school because they don't take an international student. And I have to have a four year college degree. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To get into med school. But here is the thing. So nursing is the closest one that I could pay for. And I love helping others. And I love science. Yeah. So yay. It's a great way to go if you're interested in both science and in helping people. Yep. And you've also talked about, well, you've described yourself as a NASA geek. I do have a great page on like, I mean, Instagram, super science girl. You can check that out. You all can check that out. Please do. I would love to have some more followers. Yeah. So, and I have loved science from a very young age. Like my dad, he used to bring NASA and science books for me, planets. And from my home country, I used to follow NASA and their pages there on how life has, I mean, evolved. I mean, Mm -hmm. astro biology is also there. Yeah. So But now with full-time schooling, I just don't have the time. The only time I have is to, I mean, update my page, my Mm -hmm. science page on NASA. So, and I have been to NASA last year and this year, I mean, in January, I was in NASA and, and it's something I would like to do. I hope to start my own YouTube channel on Mm -hmm. science. I mean, I love all kinds of science. Me too. Chemistry, biology. I mean, it's the best thing ever. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. And I can completely relate to the sense of, oh, I don't have time for everything, but I wish I did. You know, like you have to... I wish uh, I could study everything. I want to study physics, but I'm already in the nursing program. (laughs) And U.S. schools are very tough. And Mm -hmm. by law, I have to be a full-time student. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I just don't have the time because by the time I come home, I'm like dead. And I and I have to <laughs> wake up at 4 a.m. in freezing cold weather at 4 a.m. to go to the hospital to do my clinical. So there is no time. I mean, I'm just a human being. <laughs> there is no time. But I wish I had more time. Oh, me too. There's so much to learn and so little time. Yeah. And uh, this is something that U.S. schools in particular, and I'm not sure about elsewhere, but there's a heavy emphasis on specialization, meaning you specialize in one thing, that's your focus of study, and 
you're not given time for much of anything else. Yeah, and I hate that. That's actually part of the reason why I chose journalism as my major, because doing journalism, you're able to kind of reach out to different kinds of people and different kinds of subjects Uh and tackle them without having to focus exclusively on one thing. Mm -hmm. So I can understand the feeling of like... There are so many awesome things in the world and I, and you don't have time for them. Yeah, sadly. And it's expensive to take so many classes. I mean, how many classes can you actually take? And especially in U.S. schools, because they are very strict. Nursing schools here, they are very, very, very strict. If you are five minutes late, get out. You're <laughs> not allowed to attend the class. You would miss your whole lecture and you would fail. And the, I mean, NPLEX style questions they're like really really difficult yeah you've mentioned kind of being exposed to science from an early age and like coming across information on the internet about how life evolved and stuff i know that you've talked before about how in bangladesh it's okay uh, i can say that again (laughs) Okay. In yeah. Bangladesh, uh, YouTube was banned a few years ago. Yeah. And, uh, that was one of the catalysts that really that played a huge role. Yes. Mm-hmm. So this, this, uh, single YouTube video, The Innocence of Muslims, mm-hmm. uh, what was that video about? Like, what was in that video that made the government of Bangladesh, like, say, you know, no more YouTube for anybody. You made fun of the prophet. How dare you? We are not uh, going to use YouTube. Okay. How dare you make fun of, I mean, Islam and the prophet? That's it. That mm. was it. If you don't like it, don't watch it. But there is no need to ban the whole YouTube or to block the whole YouTube. As if people are stupid. As if we cannot, I mean, bypass the ban. VPN is there. You can easily (laughs) bypass that. That's how I I have bypassed the ban. Because it does Mm -hmm. not help. People who has to use it, they will find a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Banning, it doesn't work. Did the government try to restrict access to anything else on the internet besides YouTube? Oh, do you know? The whole internet was banned in the country for a few days. In 20... 15. Yes. So imagine you cannot shop. You cannot do business. You cannot send a damn email. I mean, they're like so <laughs> stupid. It happened mm-hmm. for a few days in 2015 in okay, so- December. And I was there at the time in Bangladesh <laughs> and I had to apply to, co- I mean, schools. I could not exchange, I mean, emails. It was stupid. My friends, they started freaking out. <laughs> U.S. friends, they thought that Zarin is dead. I'm like, I'm not dead because I just could not access Facebook because the whole internet was banned in the whole country. It's interesting that it lasted only a few days because obviously it must have impacted the economy of yes, the country. Yes, of course it did. You cannot do business. I mean, it's very foolishness on part of the government. It's very interesting to me that people's worldviews and religions are so fragile <laughs> that they it cannot withstand knowledge from the outside. It's like, if your religion is true, <laughs> then there should be no reason to fear outside information. Yeah, exactly. I wonder if that thought ever enters anyone's mind who tries to censor knowledge. Not that I know of. All it does is just show that your own worldview is not that strong. I guess one question we should go over is how yes. can people in the U.S., atheists, skeptics, free thinkers, even people who may be religious but who adhere to liberal values mm-hmm. and humanist values and care about other people, mm-hmm. what can they do to show solidarity or support for people who are in the position you were in in your country, who need to get out of the country but uh, haven't been able to like you have, what can people like myself who are kind of privileged and born into positions of privilege, but who still care about people in different situations do about that? Oh my gosh, because everyone is different. I mean, for example, uh, like I knew how to speak in, I mean, English while I was in my home country. Okay, but some other, I mean, atheists, may not be able to speak in, I mean, English. So everyone is different. Yeah. But mm-hmm. the whole thing comes down to money. 
Yeah. And the other thing is that force your government to change the law. Stop funding Saudi Arabia. Why? And, uh, and change the, I mean, asylum laws because it will take me three years to wait for, uh, my, I mean, interview. That's ridiculous. Do you <laughs> really need three years to take an, I mean, interview? Just hire more staff. USCIS, they should hire more staff. Just do that. I mean, how long it takes to hire more staff to take the, I mean, interview? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And see if a person, if their story is credible, if they, if you want to give them, I mean, asylum or not, but just don't keep them hanging because I don't want to be an undocumented, I mean, illegal in this country, illegal mm -hmm. person in this country, because I have followed the law. I have applied for a student visa and mm -hmm. I came here legally. Yeah. But my visa, it's about to, I mean, expire and it's very, I mean, expensive. I mean, to, maintain the student i mean status because i have to pay i mean out of state fees i have to pay a lot just to breathe in this country just to i mean attend a school in this country a public school i mean everyone they can help by uh changing the law change the i mean asylum laws in your country i mm -hmm. mean it should be like this you have to process the, I mean, asylum case in one year. Why? Because justice, I mean, delayed is justice denied. So mm -hmm. it's very, I mean, important to process this as soon as possible. And I mean, it can also help the people on the right because they always complain that people are filing for false, I mean, asylum cases. Yeah. Then mm -hmm. like, I mean, if you check them, like, I mean, in one year, then you, you won't have to give the work, I mean, permit because here is the thing. I mean, uh, you are allowed to work here. I mean, if you are waiting for your, I mean, asylum case for more than six months. Okay. Mm -hmm. So don't do that. Just <laughs> vet the cases because there are people who do file false, I mean, asylum claims to get mm -hmm. work, I mean, permit or to stay in the U.S. I get that. I, I mean, understand that. But like when the process takes so long, then that just increases the uh, perception among some people that there's so many people here who it's like if you take three years to process an asylum claim, that might give people like especially on the right who like to complain about these kinds of things mm -hmm. for bigoted reasons. It might give them the impression that, well, it's taking three years. So what's taking so long? Whereas if you speed up the process... Not only is it better on a human rights and justice angle, it's better for the people seeking asylum because they're actually seeking safety. Yes, most of them are. They are seeking safety. And I just want to live a normal life. Mm -hmm. Go to school, have kids someday, marry someday. I mean, just to, I just want a normal life. That's it. Yeah, and uh, and it's like, I mean, insane that I have to wait for three years to hear my first, like, I mean, interview. That's ridiculous. And you can actually vet people out. Yeah. By just speeding up the whole thing. You can mm -hmm. vet people out who are lying or who are frauds. Yeah. By speeding up the case and not giving them the permission to work because you at least have to wait till six months mm -hmm. to get the work permit. Yeah. Like people who actually needs help process their case quickly. I mean, allow them a, a way to work. Yeah. Or to stay here. Yeah. But it's just ridiculous that it goes on forever. It takes forever to be a U.S. 
citizen. That's just insane to me. One analogy I can think of is in the medical field, uh-huh. which you might be able to relate to in some way. So in medical science is kind of different from other branches of science. Mm-hmm. For one thing, it's like applied science. And for another thing, discoveries and patents and inventions in medical science are kind of rushed through the research stage for a very important reason. And that's because lives are at stake. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas like in physics or biology or some of the more hard sciences, research is very slow and deliberate because it doesn't have as all science has an impact on human well-being, but not as immediate as something like medical science. Mm-hmm. So when we go into the realm of politics and foreign relations and all that, speeding up the process for asylum seekers is important because of the safety aspect. So there's kind of an analogy there, and it would put a lot of people's minds at ease, people who shouldn't have anything to worry about anyway. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't have to convince people that diversity is good for America. But unfortunately, that's the case, because there are people in this country who are fearful of outsiders. And this country suffers, especially under Trump, it suffers from a sense of xenophobia that's kind of bubbling up under the surface and has been for the last few years. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of things happening that are making it difficult for immigrants and asylum seekers. And I really hope we get through that. And I really hope my fellow humanists and uh, liberals Mm -hmm. will really band together and really make our voices loud and clear about what direction this country needs to go in in order to continue to flourish. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. What would you say to any of my listeners who might be religious, but who do care about human rights? Is it important for liberals and humanists to seek allies in our religious peers, like um, religious people who have liberal values and who want to help people? Yes. Is it more important to seek those allies out than it is to criticize religion? Or is it, do we need to like be careful that we aren't legitimizing religion? Some people have argued that, well, If you seek out allies from religious people who are nevertheless liberal and forward thinking, then that legitimizes a religion and eventually things will start to slide back again. So how do you balance the criticism of religion with needing to build your numbers and and seek common ground to make changes in the political arena? Hmm. Interesting question. Uh, Well, I work with, I mean, like, I mean, everyone, uh, my, uh, friends are there who go to church, but I still tell them the truth that Mm -hmm. like I'm an atheist and it's not true. Faith is not true. So yes, like speak the truth, but try to, I mean, understand that, uh, People and, I mean, ideas, they are not the same thing. People have rights. Ideas do not have rights. Okay. Mm -hmm. So just because I'm saying negative things about your faith, it does not mean that I don't like you as a person. So, yes, I mean, we have to, yes, reach out to people who are liberal, but they still go to church, mosque, or they like to pray to God. Yeah, I mean, you can be nice to people. It's really not that hard. My Mm -hmm. land, I mean, lady, she's a Trump supporter. Yeah. (laughs) And she works at a church. Yeah, but she has still, I mean, allowed me to stay at her house. And I pay very less in rent. Yeah, she has Mm -hmm. still, I mean, allowed me. So... People are worth so much more than they... They're worth so much more than their beliefs. Beliefs, yes. They are worth so much more than their faith, belief, political party. Uh Uh-huh. I agree. And the way I approach it is, okay, we need to build our numbers. We need to make our voices heard. We need to seek allies and get people on our side to make necessary changes in society. Mm -hmm. Uh Uh-huh. So we can table the religion discussion for later. Let's like get together on the common human ground. Human rights. Get, to, get together on human rights, change what we need to change, and then we can have the other discussions later. But we need to like prioritize human rights, especially when there's human rights abuses happening all around us. 
And it's happening more and more in this country. And that's why a lot of people are talking about the U.S. being on the trajectory to being a third world country be- yes. just because of how this because of how backwards it's getting. Yes. Yes, it is. Uh huh. On that note, where can people find you, reach out to you, see the work you've done online, that kind of thing? Just type my name. Z-E-I-N-R-I-N. Zerin Feroz. I mean, F-I-R-O-Z-E, Feroz. That's it. Just Google your name and you'll find a lot of stuff you've done, mm-hmm. other podcasts you've been on, that kind of thing. I really encourage everybody to follow Zarin. Uh-huh. And because uh, uh, I think you're saying a lot of really good and important things. Mm-hmm. And I want to thank you very much for taking time out of your day to talk to me. Welcome. Like, I'm so happy. Thank you for being here. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And Mm -hmm. you'll hear from me next week. Thank you for listening to A Leap of Doubt. If you liked what you heard, please consider leaving a review on iTunes. If you want to get involved in the kinds of discussion this show is meant to encourage, you can find the official discussion group on Facebook at facebook.com slash groups slash a leap of doubt. You can follow me and get in touch with me on Twitter, where my username is at TheNatheist. Feedback and criticisms are always welcome. The opening clip is an excerpt from the audiobook God is Not Great by Christopher Hitchens, courtesy of Hachette Audio. Text copyright 2007 by Christopher Hitchens. Audio production copyright 2007, Hachette Audio. Used with permission. The opening and ending music is Jade by Esther Nicholson, and is used under license. The audio was edited by Rich Lyons of the Living After Faith podcast. If you enjoy the work I do, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon at patreon.com slash a leap of doubt.